は皆さんおはようございます。はいえっと、私はあの九州大学、えー、大学院言語文化研究院の、えー、言語研究会の、えー、今年度代表を務めております井口と申しますよろしくお願いします、えー、本日あのジャパン・ユーエス・エクスチェンジ・ディベート・ティー・サーザン・セミリーこれが、えー、と開催されておりますけれども、えー、井上先生の方からご紹介がありまして、えー、この,あの大学院の、えー、言語文化研究院言語研究会の方で、えーこちらで、まあ、あの例会を定期的に開催しているんですけれども、えー、その、えー、例会の一つとして、その講演会を、えー、実施させてくださいということでご相談を受けましたので、えーえー、ぜひそのようにお願いしますということで、今回の開催に参りました。えー、今日もすでにあの午前中から、えー、プログラムが行われたみたいですけれども、えー、この講演会、えー、あのキュファート先生とか、Thank you very much,、uh, Professor Eguchi.、Uh, now, I'd like to start the second part of the Japan US Exchange Debate 2017. The whole tour. It's、uh, sponsored by the US、um, National Communication Association, CIDD, Committee for, on International Debate and Discussion, and、uh, sponsored by Japan Debate Association and generously supported by GDEC. And、uh, this local event,、uh, sponsored by our Faculty of Language and Cultures, Kyushu University, and、uh, Kyushu Chapter of Japan Debate Association. And also, debates are also helped by ESS students.、Um, in this part of the program, we have a talk、uh, by Professor Dr. John Keppert,、uh, Associate Professor of Communication Studies、uh, and Director of Forensics at California State University, Northridge. And the following the talk, we have an、uh, informal discussion. and Maybe since we have、uh, this small number of people attending,、uh, um, Dr. Kepa will probably go for a little bit informal and sort of questions and、uh, we'll go on.、Uh, the whole session is videotaped for publication purpose, but、uh, I will、uh, show the link to preview the recording. So if you don't like to make it public,、uh, you can say so.、Um, The details、uh, by Dr. Keppert and also two students、uh, they are preparing for debates、uh, later on、uh, on the back of the program. So I would like to save time on that and、uh, probably move on to the Dr. Keppert's talk. Hello, thank you all for joining us today. I appreciate、uh, you coming out. One thing that I will often tell my students、uh, in the US is that I did competitive debate for eight years in high school and college, and they train us in the United States to speak as fast as possible when we do debate competition. And I was already a very fast speaker. So if I start to go too quickly, please let me know. I promise it will not offend me, I, I won't be bothered. We have a series of strategies that we use with my students when I'm going too quickly.、Uh, some of them will just put a hand up and slowly lower it.、Uh, some of them will write slow down and show it to me.、Uh, I had one student that would go, ah! Don't do that.、Uh, but any other way of letting me know I'm going too quick, I'd be happy to go back over something. I also never say things the same way twice. And so if you ask me to repeat something, I will definitely give you the same content, but I will definitely. Phrase it differently. So please, if anything is unclear, feel free to ask me. And I'm really excited to be talking about changing trends in debate, in particular about reaching minority communities in the United States,、uh, because for me, debate has always been a home.、Uh, this is where I went to high school in Notre Dame. This is where I accidentally stumbled into my love of debate. I wanted to be an actor,、uh, and I lived in Los Angeles, so that was actually feasible. My father said before I could do acting, I had to try it once before we got an agent or did any of those things. And to join the theater department at Notre Dame, you had to do a year of speech. 
and one of my options was debate. And I said, oh, well, I would way rather argue with people for a year instead of just giving speeches before I become an actor. And I never looked back. Uh, it was where a very awkward and goofy and high-strung intelligence kid is encouraged to exchange arguments, to have a voice. It was one of the first places where I felt that my naturally talkative and argumentative nature was rewarded instead of punished. Uh, and I was very much with the, we are staying in uh, Akihabara in Tokyo, which we are told is the geek capital, uh, which is good for me because I am a geek. I, I was not popular when I was in high school. Uh, when I went on to the University of Southern California, I went there on a debate scholarship. And once again, a debate opened doors for me. I didn't pay for my college education because I was able to do debate. Uh, and it has since given me a job at California State University, Northridge. In fact, going on this tour a lot, people ask me about Anne-Marie Todd, uh, who came on this tour as a debater and then again as a coach. And she was one of my coaches. She was influential in pushing me to join the committee that put me right here in front of you today. So debate has literally been life-changing for me in ways that I don't know how to articulate. But uh, that's not for everyone, as it turns out. Uh, I have never worried about whether or not arguing would be appropriate or inappropriate. I have never worried that if I walked into a classroom or if I walked into a debate round that people might discipline how I spoke. I've never been told I was too assertive. I've never been told that I sound shrill. Uh, I've never been told that I was being bitchy because I asked an aggressive question. In short, debate has always been a place for people who look like me. Uh, as a middle class, straight, white, American, able-bodied citizen, I hit the privilege lottery. It means that buildings are designed for me. It means that curriculum speak to my interests. It means the ways that I was raised to speak and understand the world have always been valued everywhere that I've grown up. And not only is that true generally socially, but one of those things that it also happens is it's also true in argument. Uh, not only the way that in America we are encouraged to communicate, but the way that we talk about what it means to be good at debate or good at argument is similarly gendered and raced. That similarly the same things that give me access to greater social capital give me greater access to debate capital. It makes it more likely that I will succeed as a debater. It makes it more likely I will be hired as a debater. And it makes it more likely that I will be valued as a debater as opposed to devalued for the fair. So it's a debate in America when I was in high school, so when I was still here, we weren't really talking about these things. We had just started to bring philosophy into debate. So we had just started to talk about things like whether or not crime was something that existed objectively or whether or not different communities were thought of as criminals differently. We were just starting in debate to talk about whether or not policies differently affected men or women. By the time I got to college, we had really started to talk more about identity but even then, it was very abstract. In the last five to 10 years in debate in the United States, we've really begun to uncover and think about these ideas that had already been happening in the academy in, amongst professors and scholars, but had it yet made its way to competitive debate. So today, just briefly, uh, there are three basic ideas that I'm gonna talk just to give you a little bit of an outline of kind of how this has evolved in the transition and to give you some basic assumptions that I will make during our conversation that I'd like to spend the rest of our time together, if we could, talking through these ideas, either to answer questions for you or to see what you think might be similar here in Japan or in other places. I didn't know before I came today that the university was so international. So it'd be very interesting to see if we see these trends in other countries and to see which of these are unique to the United States. So today I'm gonna talk very brief briefly about three things. Uh, first, I'm gonna discuss how identity generally influences how we communicate. Second, I'll discuss how these same influences then affect how we debate, especially in the United States and the way we train our debaters. And then finally, I'm gonna discuss two ways in which we've started to address these issues, both within the debate round and outside of it. So both how we argue differently about identity and how we are engaging in structural solutions to try to fix this, how we are trying to change 
debate practice. So I'll be talking about these three ideas. I'll also uh, display the basic idea before I launch into it a little bit more. So if you haven't had a chance to copy everything on this slide yet, it's going to repeat. Uh, I also generally use very little text on my slides. I included more than I usually do because uh, I know that we have different levels of English proficiency. So if I move too quick through the slide, it's okay to ask me to go back one. So I'm used to having slides that are mostly images. So it might not occur to me that folks are still trying to write down or read what I put up here. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is how identity influences how we communicate generally. So outside of the context of debate. And in particular in the United States, uh, these are a list of qualities uh, that discuss how middle class white men like myself are encouraged to speak. That, and some of these things I know were different from Japan because it's caused some difficulties in trying to figure out, for example, where to go for dinner. Uh, whereas I am, I've been encouraged to be very direct. And so when they say, what do you want to say? I want to do this. Whereas I'll ask some of our hosts and I'll say, where should we eat? And they say, we can eat this or we can eat something else or we can do whatever you wanted to do. So I know that in Western cultures, and in particular in the United States, we are a very low context culture, which means that we need to explain everything. It's one of the reasons we talk too much. Uh, and we are also a very direct and individualistic culture. Uh, I also have been taught to be linear. Uh, I've been trained since I was a very young age that the purpose of my communication was to go from point A to point B, that I should always be moving towards a particular goal. It means that my communication has also been trying to be pragmatic. That uh, one of the cliches in America is a fight between a husband and a wife might be the wife says, I had a rough day at work today. And the husband says, oh, well, you should stop talking to that person that upsets you. And the wife says, well, but I want to tell you about how my day was and why it upset me. And the man says, but why are you telling me? You could just fix the problem. Uh, part of the reason, whenever I give that example to my students, they all nod vigorously because they have all had that argument. And part of the reason is men are encouraged to be pragmatic communicators. We are encouraged to solve problems with our communication, that we talk to resolve something, not for the pleasure of talking. That also means that we are encouraged to be assertive, that if we want something, we are told to speak up, and it is expected that we do. That I shouldn't, as an American man, sit and wait for someone to offer me something. If I want it, I'm supposed to say, hey, please give this to me. And I'm encouraged to be very individual and independent. That I'm not supposed to depend on other people when I want something. And that means when I communicate, I'm not supposed to worry about how it affects everything else. One of the challenges we've had in talking to some of the debaters in Japan, is we have very different coaching styles is in America, you do debate to stand out. In Japan, students are often wary of standing out. They don't want to be seen as different from everybody else in the debate. So that coaching style, we've noticed, can cause difficulties. We are supposed to be independent communicators when trained in the United States. I'm supposed to focus on being very rational, that everything that I communicate about should have a reason, should have a particular logic to it. And finally, I'm supposed to be reserved, that I shouldn't be very loud. Uh, that if I want to speak with someone, I should only speak to someone sitting next to me. I shouldn't be yelling across the room to people that I want to talk to. These are all the ways that uh, middle class white men are encouraged to communicate. Some of these are more specific to gender, some of these are more specific to race. But if we look at how folks that look like me are encouraged to talk in the United States, this is what we're encouraged to do. However, other folks are encouraged to communicate differently. If we think about how women are encouraged to communicate or how people of color, so African Americans, uh, Mexican Americans, Asian Americans, how people that are not read or understood as United States citizens, even if they are, so even, for example, Mexican Americans or Japanese Americans whose families might have lived in the United States for hundreds of years, are still often not encouraged to communicate in the ways that white American citizens are. They have different expectations. So folks that who are not white or who are not perceived to be masculine, who are people assume are women, are encouraged to be indirect. So a lot of things we'll talk about in linguistics in the United States is the, the use of tag questions. And so when women make a request, they will, they're encouraged not to say, could you 
pass the milk or ask the question, they're saying, can I ask you this? And then ask a question. Right? Is it okay that? And then ask the question. Uh, American women, and I've noticed this happens a little bit in Japan too, but especially American women, apologize for everything. Uh, and it's, if, they bump, if I bump into a woman, she will apologize to me. If I interrupt a woman, she will apologize to me. And that's because of the American cultural understanding of gender and communication is that indirectness. And so when women speak directly, it is often valued negatively. That women in the United States and people of color are encouraged to be nonlinear. So whereas today I've organized this in a very particular way, let me move from where I was, where I am now, where we are going. Uh, a nonlinear style is often taught or culturally accepted in other cultures in the United States, where the point of the communication is more empathetic to understand and create connections with other people and not linear or pragmatic. And so the conversation doesn't have to go in one direction. Conversation can jump around to lots of different topics, so it's nonlinear. It goes to lots of places instead of in one direction. That women and people of color are encouraged to be more submissive and cooperative in their communication. So, whereas I'm encouraged to be aggressive and individual and competitive, women and people of color are encouraged to be cooperative, to work with each other instead of to try to win or overcome the other side. And finally, uh, whereas men and white folks in the US are encouraged to be rational and reserved. Women or people of color are expected to be or trained to be more emotional, to focus more on feelings and sensation, and to be more expressive, uh, to dress more elaborately, to use hand gestures, to speak loudly regardless of context. So that this expressive form of communication, the use of greater slang, uh, to use uh, non-colloquial non language, and so not to speak for the purpose of expressing oneself instead of the purpose of accomplishing a goal. And I'll give you an example. Uh, in, the, in the United States, when we are children, we're taught to play games. Young boys are encouraged to play games like sports or games like cops and robbers, where one, so one team is the police and one team is the robbers, and you try to tag all of the robbers, you try to get them out. Uh, we're encouraged to play these games that have clear sides, there's the cops and the robbers. Uh, back in the 80s, we would play cowboys and Indians, but people don't really play that game anymore. Or sports, where there's the home team and the away team. And the purpose of communication in games like that is to achieve the goal. In baseball, uh, the first baseman talks to the pitcher to tell him where to throw the ball, not to see how his wife and kids are doing. It's a, the purpose of communication is to accomplish the goal. That's why you talk to each other. The sides are distinct and clear. Uh, young women are taught to play games like tea party or house, uh, where there is no goal. Nobody wins in house. Uh, the purpose of the game is to sit around and imagine that you are all having a conversation over tea, and the purpose of the game is to talk, not to accomplish a goal. So it's not that everyone plays sports and then becomes a particular type of communicator, but that type of communication is reinforced over and over and over again. It starts when we're young, where women are taught to talk to each other for the purpose of talking to each other, and men are taught to talk to each other to serve a goal. Then that happens in school and in classrooms, then it happens in the workplace, it happens in interpersonal relationships. And another example, as I pointed out before, is that white folks are generally trained to be more reserved in their communication. So uh, if I'm in a restaurant, sometimes it will be difficult to hear me. Well, not in Japan. In Japan, Americans are always the loudest people in any room. But in the United States, I might be a quieter person, whereas a, a Latino person or an African American might be willing to yell across the restaurant or across the table to talk to me. And it's different cultural standards, that if you live socioeconomically in areas that are louder and they are busier and you need to yell to communicate to people, then you are used to being louder. If we see how race sometimes relates to class, and so white folks are more likely to be middle class in the United States, they're more likely to live in isolated home units, so you don't have to yell or be super expressive. And so that means that when you go out into public, then your communication styles reflect that. Does that example make sense? How uh, we can see ways that men and women are asked to communicate differently, and people of different race and socioeconomic backgrounds are asked to communicate differently. Well, here's the problem. These are tendencies. Tendencies become expectations. And so it's, it might be the case 
that young boys are encouraged to play sports and young girls are encouraged to play tea party. But some young boys like to play with Barbies and some young girls like to play sports. However, they are violating expectations. They are doing things that they're not supposed to be doing. And not only do tendencies become expectations, whereas an emotional man in the United States is looked down upon, or a overly rational woman might be looked down upon. If you want to think about expressiveness, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton both spoke at high volumes in the campaign. Only one of them was called shrill. And only Secretary Clinton was said she had to be more careful about how she spoke. Whereas the president, who can often barely speak in a complete sentence, was never chastised for the way that he could speak. So those, those expectations become tendencies, but then what really happens is that expectations become pedagogy. So the first thing that we've just talked about is that first slide, right? is the way we communicate generally. But if those ways that we communicate generally become expectations, when we teach argument, and when we teach communication, those same expectations then get mapped onto what we think of as a good or a bad argument. So, if you'll recall the things that I said before that make a masculine communicator or a white middle class communicator are things like directness, linearity, being assertive, being rational, or being reserved. These are also the things that we think are a good debate that debate privileges competition over cooperation. Debate privileges an end goal. So today the resolution that we debated is the Federal Bureau of Investigation uh, should be able to use a backdoor entry into cell phones. So we debated whether or not smartphone companies should make it possible for the government to access information on people's smartphones. Which if we're thinking about what makes a good argument in that context, it would be one that was direct and specific and said, if we increase government authority, it will lead to increased civil rights violations. Unless we increase the government authority, it will lead to terrorism. These arguments were linear, right? that they have to go from point A to point B. If A happens, if we give them this opportunity, then they will use it against minority communities, then that will make it harder for people to protest or to engage in social justice activism. Very linear. It also, good debate or good argument is supposed to be assertive and rational. We're not supposed to talk about how we feel about arguments. We're not supposed to talk about our personal experience in argument. In fact, we're supposed to separate ourselves from arguments and debate. We are trained to say this argument is true not because I believe it or because of my experience, but because I have evidence from other people that says that this argument is true. And, and we're also supposed to be reserved. And we're also supposed to think about how when we make arguments that we stick to the facts, that we focus on the evidence only. So that means, however, that before we talked about how tendencies become expectations and expectations become pedagogy. Well, the expectations in pedagogy happen in debate, so that if, uh, if women or people of color aren't expected to be assertive or aggressive, uh, and aren't trained to be assertive or aggressive, it either means if they are assertive or aggressive, then they are looked negatively at. That you can ask any woman in debate, or just any person of color in debate, and say, what happened the first time you were super aggressive in a cross-examination? And they will probably talk about how they were told to calm down, that they were too aggressive. Whereas no white debater, or is ever, no white male debater is ever told that. So that when we think about how those things get mapped into debate, if a black woman is aggressive when she asks questions, she's seen as inappropriate. If a, black, if a white man is aggressive when he asks questions, he's seen as a good debater. So that it works both ways. Communities are not trained to argue effectively and are not rewarded the same when they do. In particular, one way that this happens is that in policy debate, we have something called role play. And the idea of role play is we adopt a resolution that imagines that the government could do something. Right? So we might say the United States federal government should reduce greenhouse gases. Right? That's very similar to the topic we debated in the United States this last year. And the idea of role play is that there is educational value in me pretending to be the United States federal government so that I imagine 
that I am, I mean, I'd have to find someone in the government I currently want to be, uh, so maybe Camilla Harris. She's a Democratic senator from California. I'd say, all right, I'm going to pretend I could propose this bill. Uh, we will debate the merits of the bill, and we will focus only on the outcomes of that policy. What would happen if the United States federal government actually did this problem? Well, the problem with this is that this means that when we role play, we imagine that we're the United States government. The United States federal government is overwhelmingly white, male, straight, and rich. The vast 90% of elected representatives in the United States meet those categories, which means if I want to role play the United States federal government, it's easy to do because most people in the US federal government look like me. They had similar cultural experiences to me. They were trained to communicate and perhaps most importantly, they are passing policies that benefit people like me. Uh, today, one of the things that are happening right now in the United States Senate is that the Republicans who are in the majority are crafting new health care legislation. They are refusing to let anyone see it before they vote on it. Uh, just this morning, I think it's this morning, I'm, st I'm getting used to the time change between here and the United States, but based on my news alert, uh, just this morning, they're going to send it to the Congressional Budget Office, which is the place in the United States government that weighs economic costs and benefits. They're the ones that say, how much will this cost? how many people will lose health insurance, how many people will get it. They're sending it to that office and no one has seen it yet except the committee. Do you want to guess how many women are on this committee? Zero. Do you want to guess how many people who are not white are on this committee? Zero. So a secret committee of white men has proposed legislation that will affect one-sixth of the United States economy and they're not letting anybody see it. Now, that's probably going to work out for me, unfortunately. But one of the things that might not work out for women is contraceptive care and whether or not to fund things like birth control or other issues of reproductive health. One thing that might not work out for people of color are health diseases like sickle cell anemia that differentially affect different racial groups. And so that if I need to role play the United States federal government, that's fine because I'm role playing that a group that when I stop role playing, when I leave the debate, I get to go back to a world where that still reflects how I see the world, that benefits me, and how I talk about it. But if we think about women or people of color, they have to imagine participating and being someone who works against them. And then they're told, well, the value is then you can leave the argument. But when women and people of color leave the argument, they're faced with the consequences of those decisions in a way that I am not. Which means that if we're thinking about argument and we're thinking about the way identity works, if we really want to address it, we have to think about what does arguing mean for different communities and folks that experience their identities differently. And that is what is new relatively about American debate in the last few years that we're just starting uh, to talk about. So we do this in two ways. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is how we address identity in the debate itself, and then I'm going to talk about how we address identity outside of the debate, structurally, how we create opportunities for debate. And the first is the idea of uh, how we debate identity itself. And we have a phrase in the US that's called the clash of civilizations debates. Does anyone know what this phrase come from, does anyone say international politics? Familiar? Do you know what it is? Yeah, Samuel Huntington. And Samuel Huntington in 1992 wrote an article and later a book where he proposed that after the Cold War, the next big conflicts would be clashes of civilizations, that it wouldn't be necessarily nation states anymore, but Christian nations, for example, versus Muslim nations. A way of thinking about how civilizations, he says that he thought initially, primarily, that religious identities would be the primary source of conflict in the world after the Cold War. In debate, we describe clash of civilization debates between two very different approaches to the way that debate should work. So you remember that before I talked about the idea of role play. Uh, there's lots of different phrases. Uh, this might not be the one the kids today use, but this is how I talked about it back in my day when I was still debating is that uh, people that want to talk about identity, or want to talk about the policy, people that think role play is good, 
Uh, people that think switching sides is good, that sometimes you should advocate for the, the one side and then you should play devil's advocate and advocate for the other. People that think that our focus should be on the outcomes of the policy. Uh, one way we talk about them is we call them straight up debaters. I mean, they, they want to be straight with the topic. They just want to debate the topic as is. Uh, we might also call them traditional debaters. We might also call them uh, policy debaters. The second type of, and these are very broad, essentializing categories. There's a lot of nuance in there, but for the sake of our discussion, there's critical debaters who say that uh, we don't actually pass policies in debate. Right? That today, we had a debate about whether or not the FBI should be given more access. If the affirmative had won that debate, the FBI doesn't get any more access. Right? Nothing happens as a result of our debates in terms of policy. But what does happen is the education that we produce in the round. What does happen is the way we talk to each other. What does happen is how we have to exist or be in that space. And critical debaters say that those debates have lasting effects on the people in the room. So whereas it doesn't psychologically harm me to imagine that I'm the United States federal government, imagine a Mexican student in the United States that has to pretend to be Donald Trump who has said that Mexicans are rapists and murderers and he wants to build a wall to keep them out. Or imagine a Muslim student that has to pretend to be Donald Trump who has repeatedly proposed bans to kick people like them out of the country. So that they have to pretend to be people that pass policies that oppress them for the sake of education. So critical debaters say that if these government interests act in the interests of some people and not others, we shouldn't force students to advocate for the devil if they're going to be called the sinner. If they're going to always be marked as evil, they shouldn't have to play devil's advocate because they will be seen as evil when they, lose the debate, they leave the debate round. They will be seen as problematic. A woman that has to imagine to be the U.S. government and has to be masculine isn't typically valued well in the United States when they leave. And we know that because Secretary Clinton got lots of criticism for acting too masculine on the campaign trail. Yet, we ask students to adapt these problematic identities in debates. And so critical debaters say that we should focus on those things. Straight up debaters say, no, no, we should only focus on the policy. So when two policy teams or when two straight up teams debate, they will tend to have that debate about the effects of the policy. When two critical teams debate each other, they will tend to see who can make the most radical philosophical change. And so they will talk about philosophy in depth. But if a straight up team debates a critical team, what you have is the clash of civilizations, is what we call that. Because almost the entirety of that debate will be about what should debate be. Should debate be straight up or critical? What are the rules? Debate was intentionally left very open in terms of the rules. When my novice debaters ask me a question, they go, can we do this in debate? I say, well, everything's debatable. Uh, so they, they say, even the rules? And I say, yes, even the rules. Because we need to think about how rules change. Rules aren't set in stone. So one of the things that we teach our students is, is how to debate what the rules mean. So if we are talking about a clash of civilizations debate in the US, that means we are talking about two fundamentally different approaches to what argument and debate should look like. So that's how we do it in debate, in the debate itself. We're also addressing and working towards addressing the needs of communities that are traditionally not served very well in debate, structurally, uh, by the use of urban debate leagues. Uh, so before I talked about debating identity, this is about identifying debaters. This is about how do we bring people into debate that traditionally are not thought of as debaters. Because remember before, I said we have expectations about what makes good communication and what makes good argument. And those things tend to be things that are the ways that white middle class men are trained to speak and act. That means that debate is often not attractive to communities that are communities of color or to women because they are either told they are bad for succeeding in that activity or they are not trained to succeed in that activity. And one thing that's worked to overcome that is urban debate leagues. Now urban debate leagues 
started officially, the first one was in the 1980s uh, in Atlanta. Uh, Emory University started a, a debate that was specifically for Atlanta public schools that weren't ordinarily served by debate. Debate in the United States happens at the high school level of private schools, like mine, or private schools that are well-funded and are taught very well. Uh, Melissa Wade, who is the director of forensics at Emory University, started an urban debate league in Atlanta, but their tradition goes all the way back to historically black colleges and universities in the United States that would have, uh, and even free slave societies in the 1800s and 1900s that would have uh, secret debate societies to be able to train people to use the argumentative strategies and the educational strategies that they weren't being given in their everyday lives. Uh, but UDLs really took off in the late 1990s uh, because George Soros created the Open Society Grant and it was designed to fund activities that would increase things like civic engagement and debaters saw an opportunity. And they said, wait, we need that money to go to underserved communities, particularly in urban areas, that don't have debate programs, that just don't have the funding to create them. Uh, today, there are now 22 urban debate leagues in the United States uh, from all across the country, uh, including one in each of the cities that all of the debaters hear from. There's one in Denver, uh, there's one in New Jersey, and there's one in Los Angeles, the LA Metropolitan Debate League. There are over 10,000 students that are served across the country in 622 schools. 32% uh, of the participants are Hispanic, 31% are African American, 10% are Asian, and 56% are women. So these are groups that are generally not taught to debate or argue, or when they are, are disciplined for it. So then what do UDLs do? Uh, why are urban debate leagues so important? Uh, because they provide two things, skills and voice. Uh, the, one of the things that UDLs do is they teach debaters, we always talk about debaters are taught critical reasoning skills. But one of the things that urban debate leagues teach, the, the communities are things like study skills or critical thinking skills, that their schools are usually underfunded. And the, the LAUSD public school system, which is the largest in the United States, and does not work very well. Uh, if you think about students who are African American or Latino, their movement to college rate is somewhere between 50 and 60 percent. Unless they participate in the Ur Urban Debate League, in which they're closer to 95 percent. Because one of the things that participation in urban debate does is, on the one hand, it teaches skills, it teaches you to communicate and to argue like white, straight, middle class men in a lot of cases. Because those are the communication forms that are valued when you're trying to get into college. And so it trains them in skills that lets them be appealing to people who ordinarily wouldn't teach them those skills. But it also, even abstractly, teaches critical thinking and research that they don't learn anywhere else. So they become much more likely to succeed in college because they're taught the study skills that their peers are not taught. But really, perhaps the most important thing about UDLs in the United States is voice. Because UDL participants will repeatedly tell us that what makes the UDL so valuable is that for that one hour and 36 minutes, they have to be listened to. If you're thinking about African American students or women students or Latino students, Somali students, Korean Americans, they are not listened to in their day-to-day -day lives. People in general aren't listening to children in the United States, but in particular, these folks don't get to talk about the things they care about and are silenced in American society. And for that amount of time, they are told that they can say whatever they want and the judge has to listen. And that is a profound experience for these communities. And it lets a lot of them see themselves on a college campus for the first time. That we also, in the educational system, women and people of color tend not to be tracked to colleges to the same degree that white men are. But when they have these UDL tournaments on college campuses, folks that are not told to go to college can actually literally see themselves on the college campus. And they see college as a place they can belong which they might not see if they're not participating in urban debate. So just in conclusion, as you can say, we're, we're working hard to try to make debate more of a home for more people. It's something, that's, something that's always been for me, uh, but this requires work, and it requires dedication, and perhaps most importantly, it requires conversation. It requires our willingness to have difficult discussions and talk to each other about how to improve uh, so with that, I'd like to open it up to a conversation with you all and to see any questions or comments that you have, either about 
how debate has worked in the United States, or how you might see similar things in your own communities and their own experiences. So thank you for so patiently listening to me rant for a little bit, and I'd love to talk to you some more. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we will go inform also anyone, any questions or comments to start with? I, I'm a little bit curious. So now in Japan, we have a big problem with the social polarization, the difference of the income. So you said you're talking about a white middle class man. Mm -hmm. But I think you have the upper class middle man. But I'm sorry, what was Upper class middle class, mm -hmm. very rich person in the yes. States. I heard that very few people do. Mm -hmm. So there are different words they speak, different from yours? Well, it's, well, yes. But it's less about different individual words uh, and more about how their expectations of who should get to speak for different classes. And so, for example, there's the idea of articulateness, right, to speak clearly. Uh, things like learning grammar. So if, has anyone in the room learned, tried to learn to speak English and struggled with the grammar and the order of words? Uh, I have. It's, English is a very difficult language to learn because it's the same letter combinations are pronounced differently at different times. Uh, the grammatical rules, some of them we kept uh, from England and some of them we ignored after we won the Revolutionary War. And so we have grammar that has changed and evolved and is very confusing for English speakers. So people that can speak grammar correctly or that know how to do the correct pronunciation tend to, their resumes or cover letters tend to be more valued when they apply for jobs. They tend to be more valued when they engage in applications uh, to the universities. And so what that means then is that if you are upper middle class or upper upper class, you probably went to a school that spent a lot of time teaching those things, uh, where you were exposed to literature at a very young age uh, that encouraged you to read and understand those grammatical structures. You probably had uh, your very own book that you could take home and use when you wanted to study in school. You probably had tutors or other ways of helping you when you struggled, and you probably had many less students in your class and many fewer teachers. So if you had all of those advantages, then when it comes time to write your cover letter, or go to a job interview, or if you have to go to an interview and you need to look like this, but you can't afford a tie or a jacket right, or a shirt, then you are less likely to succeed. And so all of those things contribute to some of the differences in polarization. And so if you know that you're supposed to look some, in the United States, you should be looking someone in the eye and shaking hands. And so I know that uh, in Japan, I always have a very awkward moment at first when I meet people. Because some folks know that Americans like to shake hands and want to shake my hand, but I don't know if they want to shake my hand, and so I try to bow because I want to be appropriate, and they want to shake my hand, and sometimes we have a really long handshake, and sometimes we have a very <laughs> short one. You may have seen when Prime Minister Abe visited the United States, uh, and our president looked ridiculous, as always, when he shook his hand for what felt like 45 minutes over and over and over again. And so if, again, if part of business or informal communication is knowing, looking someone in the eye, shaking their hand, referring to them in a particular way. Those are ways of interacting with elders that are unique to male and white and upper middle class communities. And different communities will speak with each other differently. And so class absolutely has an effect on trying to figure out getting into college or getting jobs or things like that. And we know that sometimes it's even as simple as a name. There have been repeated studies in the United States where they'll send the exact same resume, two different versions to the same employer, with either a man's name or a woman's name, or a traditionally white Anglo-sounding name, or a traditionally black or Mexican or Latino-sounding name. And overwhelmingly, the white male resume gets more positive responses, even though the rest of the resume is identical. And so even things like, who do people think you sound like? That's it. Even, even if you yourself aren't particularly white or you don't present as white, uh, if people think you are white, if you have light skin, or if your name sounds European, you still benefit from some of those same language structures. <coughs> um, about 30 years ago, uh, I think, I'm pretty sure, an African-American uh, education writer, Lisa Del Pitt, she wrote uh, a couple of papers on uh, 
African American minority liter literacy, uh, so I think we're talking about reading and writing skills. And she coined the term codes of power. And the codes of power more or less correspond to the white male uh, sort of privileged um, skills that you mentioned. And her argument was that all stops should be pulled out that so that people of color and African American kids can learn and absorb these skills and become masters or mistresses of them. And the point, uh, it, it's been interpreted as a very conservative assimilationist argument, which I think is kind of unfair in a way, because what she also said was one, that white teachers have to ch uh, change their teaching strategies, uh, particularly when they're te uh, teaching uh, African American kids of working class background who are used to very authoritative parenting and teaching styles. Mm -hmm. The second point she was arguing was that more or less they, they should be educated to become masters or mistresses of different registers. Mm -hmm. So without devaluing the kind of register they use in their home communities, that they also use and, and familiarize and become skilled in the use of what she calls the codes of power. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think she took a fairly negative view of more particularist, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, perspectives, which just said, well, I think perhaps that, um, well, we should encourage more pluralism, I guess. Her point was, no, you know, if, if we want to succeed in this kind of society, the reality is we have to master and become mistresses of these particular skills. Uh, what's your view on that? I have a lot of views, but I also think that I've been talking a lot. And so what I'd like to see uh, if there are views that other folks have, because th this is a question that happens a lot in debate as well, mm. as what should the strategies be? Is it a good idea to teach assimilation strategies which value the initial cultural code but may enable success? Or should we try to change what we value? Right? So should we value alternate forms of communication make it more pluralistic? Should we have an even more radical response uh, and actively work to devalue the things that are usually valued? So I'd like to hear what other people might think. Um, and even if, if you don't think something arguments that you might see or things that you might have heard or read about kind of this discussion. Yeah. At the risk of, of, of exercising my white, white male privilege more than I should, um, the, the point is also that they can be instrumentalized mm -hmm. for a radical purpose. Mm -hmm. So they can be stripped in a way of the original white male mm -hmm. identity markers and customized or assimilated to a different purpose, a different sort of, you know, cultural identity. Mm -hmm. That would be the additional point. Mm -hmm. Often we hear this debate as whether or not the master's tools can tear down the master's That's house. The one of the but what might other folks think about this? Um, speaking from my own experience um, as a young woman going through um, many different formats of debate um, in the U.S., it's it's been interesting, right? So John briefly mentioned like what it looks like for a young woman to be aggressive or confident in a speech um, and how that is portrayed. Um, but it's been interesting to go through, I, I, I do world's format now for the typical style, and sometimes we'll encounter like all female tournaments, right? Or you'll encounter um, multiple judges from around the world will give you feedback on how you speak. And I have been told directly uh, multiple times that like, my voice is too high, I need to practice like speaking in a lower register in order to sound more assertive. Um, but in the same vein, I have other, um, other individuals who want me to capitalize on my experiences in a way that feels like I'm tokenizing my identity as a woman. So they want me to be very like hyperactive, like second wave feminism, and to talk about what it means to care about others because I logically should know how to care more than my male partner or something along those lines. Or there um, is a lot of contention right now about um, having all women tournaments, or it's not necessarily all women, but all non-male identifying tournaments. So they want to be both gender inclusive, um, as long as it's not white men. Um, and that can be really hard too, because it's in some ways capitalizing on the fact that the the sphere of debate where I'm existing is becoming very liberal, and liberal insofar as they want to reject conservative ideas for the fact that they're conservative. So it's almost demonizing then um, a way of thinking which also isn't leading to a better evolution of thought. Um, but then if we're going to talk about the sheer, how effective has, has that been, right? Um, I consider myself now 
um, a lot more masculine of a, of a speaker, um, and I'm constantly told I'm more masculine of a speaker in compared to my female counterparts. But I'm kind of happy that it turned out that way because I, I feel like it allows me to better enter spaces where I wouldn't have had the confidence to otherwise. But at the same time, like I, I feel very confident when I'm wearing high heels, like I, like I am now, because I've been trained through all of these years that like when I put those on, like I'm in the front of the room, and you are going to listen to what I have to say. I don't care if I'm five foot. I don't care if my hair is significantly longer than yours or what register my voice is in. Like you are going to listen because I have researched and I know my merit because I've been afforded these spaces that have been carved out for me. So I think that it can go both ways. Um, I just think that the trick is to not demonize either side solely because of their characteristics because once you do that then you're really taking away the critical aspect from both, um, in my humble opinion. <coughs> I've been told, for context, I'm from Chile, that you America and raised there. And I've been told several times in Chile that I think like a man. Mm. Like that's the expression. and. And it's very interesting for me because, um, yeah, like, just like we were discussing, or you were mentioning at the beginning, and this is a conversation that I have with several people in this room, even though the, the idea, the current idea that we shouldn't encourage gender behavior specific to men or women, that is still the words that we use. Just like, uh, what is your name? Alison. Alison just said, I'm very masculine now. Instead, uh, sorry if it sounds like criticism in, in any way, but instead saying, I'm more assertive now, or I'm more practical now, like the word is masculine. That caught my attention because in Chile it was always this discussion like, yeah, no, I don't think like a man, I'm practical. I don't think like a man, I'm less emotional than other people. And that conversation, maybe also debate, is really interesting for me because to what point a person, I think it's related to what Alison was saying, like in a way we're trying to go against ideology, but on the other way, um, I'm sorry, on the other hand, we do know that we will be rewarded if we accept, if we comply, we will get farther, right? So this, this, this feeling of, okay, I want to be the difference. I want to be the, the one with the critical theory behind me and, and go against certain expectations. It means that you have to fight that and it takes energy and it's every day. So for personally, I have that conflict, mm -hmm. personal conflict, like to what point I communicate with my classmates, with my teachers, with my friends. Like when my friends who study who are in the area of critical theory or gender studies say xenophobic jokes. So I'm there and I'm like, it hurts me so much. <laughs> and then you, 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 you wonder, and then I think it's, it's related to activism and how militant you are, how your thoughts, and this is something that you also mentioned, like uh, to, what, to what extent we, we carry this social, and, oh, I forgot the word, I'm sorry, someone can finish that. Baggage. <laughs> huh? Baggage. More than baggage, this social responsibility um, to, to, like, to, to make the change, it. to yeah. make the change, right? Because if I'm a, I, I personally don't debate, I have debated, mm -hmm. but I don't debate. Um, what calls my attention is that I, I've been in workshops like this, uh, discussing Habermas, Gramsci, right. Marxist theory, and then there is the um, the debate, the the actual example, let's say. And at some point, it still feels like, yeah, we have to win. This is how we talk. Like everything changed is in the act, in in the act of debating. So that's that for me is also interesting. Like should it should we also be discussing this terminology? So. In, in a Chomskyan way, we start thinking of changing behavior. Mm -hmm. I don't know, so I'm thinking. Thank you so much for sharing that. So some of the things that I think are really important there are how can critical awareness become an alibi 
Now, how can people that, uh, in America we might we use the phrase that someone is woke, uh, W-O-K-E, like as if they, had, they are awake. Uh, that they are woke if they're, if they're asking these critical deep thought questions. But very often it is people that say they are woke that will then say something racist. Uh, or will then say something xenophobic, as you were just, just describing. So it's, how might this critical awareness be an alibi to say, oh, but I'm not like those other people that say those things. I know it's a joke. Yeah, that instance. makes a difference. <laughs> and this is, that's a, thank you so much, that's a phenomenal example of the role playing example that I was talking about earlier, right? That you can say, I know it's a joke, and then it makes it different if the joke is never about you. <laughs> if, if you are not the consequence of the joke, it is easier to say, oh, I was just joking, why are you so upset? And it is a way of delegitimizing when yes. liberals are called out for when we do things poorly, and we're going to. If you are raised in a system that tells you that your opinion is always better, it takes a long time to step outside of that, and ultimately you never will step entirely outside of it. So it's a question of how do we respond to that criticism that becomes important. And the other thing you said that I thought was so important is, and I really appreciated, was how do we critique these terms without using them? And that we need to point out that practicality is gendered as masculine because it will be used that way. But are we just reproducing the same thing by saying, oh, that is masculine communication? So I think so it's, it's a, a use reference kind of issue. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's a phenomenal question to ask. Like, how yeah, do we do in this? In semiotics, uh, at the, well, from my point of view, in, the, in what I've studied, that's also the social cognitive, you know, like reproduction, as you say, legitimation of, of language. Mm -hmm. So, so for example, in the same example mm -hmm. of the joke it's like okay it doesn't the, it doesn't matter how much i understand critical theory if at the end i'm still gonna be legitimizing mm -hmm. certain kinds of talk mm -hmm. by making jokes that i think are not dangerous but they are mm -hmm. because you unconsciously you're always putting the, these ideas there mm -hmm. so i related to that and related to yeah the mm -hmm. this the already established terminology mm -hmm about emotions, about feelings, about behavior, in terms of gender, that's already established. It's kind of... Thank you. <laughs> so, don't people ask how much the problems that most of the other who are, you know, not non-white or non-male, how much is this the problem of the format of debate itself? Do people not ask that question? Should, you know, this this format has been going on for two thousand years or so. Mm -hmm. You know, um, why is that unchangeable? Mm. I, I think you're asking a great question about the nature of format. There's some really interesting uh, academic and feminist work about the ancient Greeks, where uh, although we know from some historical research that African societies were engaged in debate four thousand years ago. When we think about academic debate, it usually gets traced to ancient Greece when Pythagoras and others used it specifically as part of their curricula. And there's some very interesting feminist work that talks about the ways that like the sophists and other ancient Greeks uh, were treated as foreign or feminine uh, because of the way that they tried to think about truth as collectively produced instead of there being one right answer at the end of the conversation. So this question about format goes back. And I, I definitely think that that is one of the challenges when we think about debate, because on the one hand, the idea of testing ideas is probably important. It's probably good to be able to weigh consequences and benefits. And so we might need two teams that are on opposing sides of a question, but how do we do that in a way that is not alienating? Right? Or how do we focus too much on competition and the winning at the expense of asking some of these some of these other questions. What does winning mean? And, and so that in one of the things that when this started when we started to have clash of civilization debates, there was a group of schools, mostly elite uh, schools, that wanted to start a separate debate league called the, the Policy Debate League, where you could not ask these questions. Right? So when you think about format, I think that what Eli's pointing to is really important. That if it's competitive activity, people are going to try to win. But what does winning mean? Is winning because we want 
to point out or understand how we communicate, or is the point of winning to win regardless of the consequences that it has on folks? And so are we willing to say, oh, I can't answer this argument anymore, so I'm going to take, in America we would say, take my ball and go home. Like, I will no longer compete against teams that have traditionally been excluded once they find out how to win at this game. I'll just create a new game. So are we engaged in the activity for the conversation it produces? Or are we engaged in the activity because it makes us feel better than other people? I think that recognizing the sensory, the affective, the emotional investment that we put is also important. Right? To say, are we willing to recognize that we become invested in the outcome and be willing to take risks? Or are we only willing to do it to the degree that some folks can win at the expense of others? Can I ask um, about, how about debating to find out what most people consider to be the truth at that point in time. I mean, that mm. is the purpose of debate. So, could, do you mean could that be a function of debate? To, well, to me, it seems to be the function mm -hmm. of proper debate. Mm -hmm. it's, it's to find out both what is true and what could be true. Because sometimes yeah. parts of those debates are about uh, how do we move in one way or the other. That we find ourselves, I think, Place like the United States at a crossroads. Uh, what type of country do we want to be? And so there's the one that we agree, like we can all agree we're very polarized. Do we value that or do we want to change that? Um, the discussion can continue, but uh, we have the time, so uh, I want to uh, officially close, uh, but uh, probably uh, you can stay a little bit, discuss, and also uh, if you are interested to um, talk with the people. Here we have a informal party after two debates, uh, so you can also join that too. Uh, it's a very important question: what is debate? And and also the one question leading to me thinking me is uh, language we are using. We are just uh, default using English as a means of communication, but uh, it's a big question that the, we are forced into the communicating in English, but. Uh, the, uh, for practical reason, the, it, it's the English, and it's a big question what is debate, what is language, and everything. So, thank you very much, and we want to continue the discussion, but uh, we want to close uh, officially the, this uh, talk and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.